So, we've decided to move forward. We're moving forward. Did you want to go with the AccuStream 5000? The one with the AccuStream jets, the massage jets, and those uh, disco lights. Ah, the Petri Dish 800. <laughs> Truth in advertising. <laughs> we aim to please. So if you just want to sign this right here. Oh, wait. I'm going to have to have my lawyer look this over. Oh, um. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, this is going to be my 10th jacuzzi sale this month. I'm the top seller in the district. <laughs> going to win a free trip to Hawaii. Well, aloha. That means hello and goodbye. <laughs> yes. Um, hold on. It's my brother. Hey, bro, what's up? What? Wait, what? Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God! All right, right. Wait, wait. wait. Aaron, is, is, wait, oh, is there anything I can do? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, don't worry. I'm on top of it. Okay, everything is going to work out. Everything will be fine. Just, just keep praying. Okay. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Give me Molly, my love. Hey, Aaron, I, I love you. Is, is is everything all right? No, that was my brother. My nephew's been kidnapped. Oh my god. Yeah, they're vacationing in Turkestan. I mean, Aaron woke up this morning and David's window was smashed with a brick and David was gone. They took his teddy bear. That's probably a good sign, right? They took it for him? Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't. I think it is. I, I gotta believe it is. Of course it is. I... I'm sorry, you probably you probably want me to go? No, no, no. Please don't go. I need the distraction. I, I, I don't you need to, to make some calls? Fly fly over there? Like I'm gonna go to Turkestan on a Saturday. I I don't I, I I'm sorry. I No, I I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm upset. About the news I received. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. So, um about the jets, the AccuStream jets. How many are there? Uh, uh, 17. 17? Whoa. What are the features again? <clears throat> well, it's got a uh, right drain, as well as the wide opening swinging doors, and the Whirlpool AccuStream massage jets, and the waterproof speaker like we discussed before. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an effing idiot who should be taken behind a barn and shot. What are Accu... AccuStream... What are AccuStream jets again? I mean, is that like a general term or something proprietary to your brand? It's a patented motorized stream specific to our Pleasure Stream jacuzzi brands, yes. Mm -hmm. Does it... Does it have a warranty? I There's a six month... I... I should probably go. I warned him not to go. I warned him not to go there. But he just had to go. He's one of those doctors without borders. You know, always got to be a hero. I mean, he's technically unlicensed, but they don't care about that stuff in Turkestan. I think I should go. I never had a kid of my own. You know, always praying to the almighty dollar, you know. I'm getting a jacuzzi instead of a... Kenny pool. It's so selfish. What was I thinking? I'm such a jerk. No, look, it, it, it isn't your fault. Robert, will you do something for me? Sure. Will you tell me I'm a good person? I, 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 I think that's yes, yes. You're a good person. Okay. Are you just telling me that because I asked you to tell me that? No, no. I mean, it's obvious. Okay, what about me? It's obvious that I'm a good person. Well, you're very clean. Yeah. What else? You seem to love your family. Yeah, I really love my brother. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Doctors Without Borders stunt was more for appearances, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, how else are you going to top being the third most successful equine attorney in San Diego County? Right. 
unless you're the first most successful or or the second. But he was a publicist? No, I... I, I oh, God. I, I'm sorry, I, I sound like a callous a-hole. No, no, not at all. You're just sad. I'm very insecure. I never even got a chance to meet this kid. You haven't? No, Aaron met the mother last month. Some refugee camp whirlwind romance. They married right outside the medical tent. So this is your uh, step-nephew? What do you mean by that? No, nothing. I... Oh, I get it. You're, you're saying we weren't even close. Well, you're right. I'm stupid. I can't even grieve right. But he's somebody's child. We all are. And besides, there's, there's so much crap going on in the world today. So much crap. Hatred and violence and fascism and anger. So much anger. I feel it every day. It's like an ache, like a, like a physical ache. And it's just one more thing to add to the pile. I keep thinking, is this it? Is this going to be the thing that breaks me? It is so tiring. Every single day. Do you have any idea what it's like, Robert? Yes, I've been there too. Open Facebook, open Twitter, check out the latest injustice. It's just another Petri dish. Rage impotently at the sky, ladder rinse repeat. So you should grieve for this child that you never knew. Because you are. What? You are a good person. Thank you. So if you could just sign right here.
hear the city fade as I leave it. We're so tired. It can't protect this oppressed with protests. So we riot. Keep filling in gaps and emotional stress. It's too quiet. I gotta drop as a means to escape this hellscape. And so I drive it. Blessed is the inner child, so easily amused. Cursed is the grown man, so often confused. What is it to lose by taking your own time? We give it so often, who does it belong to? To remove the pressure is the most sublime, to discover your own powers, to find your truth. But what's the difference between leaving and running? One seeks to further grow and the other requires shoes. What's the difference between leaving and running? One finds a location and the other finds you. sat by one alone and when I think of bonfires well, I'm reminded of high school because I was already struggling to fit in and I would try my best to be like everybody else a large black man trying hard to be an average white kid I'm ashamed at that fact but one day I was invited to a party like a real one and this was new to me because besides the fact that I had a strict black mother who never let me go out I generally just wasn't invited to things. So you can imagine my excitement when I heard there was a bonfire by the beach. I spent time over planning to try and impress kids that I would see every single day. Because Party Rod would be different. People would like Party Rod. When I arrived, I was greeted by Cyrus and Jeff. And they told me that niggers weren't welcome. So I ran as fast as I could. What's the difference between leaving and running? Running, 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 running. nice but have you learned some wisdom police are quick to say that you resist them sex is nice but have you fucked the system the world's a toilet let's fix the plumbing to fund the cops and give the schools the funding i return to earth with all cylinders gunning what's the difference between leaving and running
Miss Winker. I am writing from the building next door in concern for your business and the state of your store. Miss Winker, I am writing in regards to the recent overgrown allotment that has found itself at the entrance of your door. Miss Winker, I would be surprised if you do not know me, though am aware I am the boy who buys eggs at eight, beer at six, and should you know me as that, I would not digress. Miss Winker, to whom this letter is for, I am writing because when I enter your store, you do not acknowledge me nor the expressions on my face despite our relationship. Miss Winker, I do not know your name either, to which I would hope you would understand. Though, Miss Winker, this correspondence, this letter to you, is to suggest that the state of your bananas are molded, and though I have tried to point this out to you, I did not want to interrupt you. You always count my money twice. Miss Winker, I would never cheat you. I am concerned of your well-being. It is dark in there and smells of off fish, Miss Winker. You must let the delivery driver know of the situation we are in, Miss Winker. I really think we could work this out. I have been thinking of the beans I bought, which were off for a month, and Miss Winker, I thought you should know that it really takes a long time for beans to go bad, and perhaps this letter finds you well. Perhaps you have a nice home you go to or a favorite bar you stop in at. Miss Winker, I can suggest the all-night diner on 4th and Sycamore. The Hollandaise is made in-house, though I do not know if you are vegan. And before I go, Miss Winker, I would like to follow up on our conversation the other day when I said thank you and good day and you did not look towards me. Did you hear me? Is everything okay at home? Your family, yourself, do you have someone who turns off the lights? I am concerned that you are neglecting the cobwebs behind the wine rack. Swirling atmosphere, you take what you're given, and all you can do is hope that your blood, sweat, and tears will make you a living or give you enough room. When the clouds overhead that seem so dark and gray are gonna pass in their own good time, and the crowds that you Step up. 
swimming upstream. Everybody. Welcome to Quarantine Kitchen. Welcome to Quarantine Kitchen. One, two, Corin. What are you trying to do? I'm Dallas. I'm Amelia. And it's breakfast time here on Quarantine Kitchen. And today, we're going to be making one of our favorite breakfast items. Bagels! That's right, bagels! We're very kosher in this house for no reason whatsoever. It's morning here in the kitchen. Bright and early. It's, oh. it's six. It's not six, but it's, it's definitely too early. You guys probably awake yet. Definitely too early for some things to Am be Am I right, enjoyed. parents? <laughs> Am I right? Am I right, parents? Too early for some stuff. All right. Since we're all stuck in our houses and we have to use the barest of essentials, things that last forever, we're definitely going to be using just two items today. Of course, bagels. And cream cheese. Cream cheese. That's right. And we toast our bagels. Right, Amelia? Yeah. Yeah. You know why mango's right here? Well, do you want to say it? Because it's an option for your bagel. Slice up a mango, put it on your bagel. Everybody loves mango on toasted cream cheese bagels, right? Of course they do. Of course they do. That's one of people's favorite things. But I don't like mango. Ah. First, you'll need a plate. We're using ours from St. Patrick's Day because we didn't get to have a party because no one's allowed to be around each other. Then grab a bagel. I prefer mine pre-cut, because who needs the extra work? <laughs> Not me. 
I mean, look at those basketball shorts. That just screams, I haven't played basketball in a decade. Plop it in the toaster oven and thumbs up. Now pose for a picture your daughter made you take and put in the video. Then grab your cream cheese. We're using Greek yogurt cream cheese because everyone else bought everything else that was available. Now it's time to spread the cream cheese on your bagel. And of course, you want to let your kids do it because it's fun. Right? Isn't this the funnest part? I mean, cream cheese had to be different than mayonnaise, right? It's not. Turns out it's a lot harder. I mean, just look at that hack job. That is... Oh, and now the bagel's on the... Oh, I mean, we've been cleaning, so it's a clean... It's a clean bagel. I mean, everybody's cleaning everything. I, I'm not worried about that. This uh, She might have just cut herself there, actually. That might be a cut. Mm. All right, let's just, we gotta, let's just speed it up. All right, I did the other side of the bagel and I did it perfect. I mean, it was, there is no excess, excess. There it is, perfection. Mangoes and wine from Akash Winery are optional. One happy kid. Good boy. And that's how you make a bagel and cream cheese. You gotta bring it in. <laughs> Thanks for watching Quarantine Kitchen. Goodbye. Next time, maybe we'll show you how to make dinner. Huh? That would be fun. Do a dinner episode. What do you think about that? I just love these bagels. I've heard a lot of unpleasant news in my day. No, David, Sylvia doesn't want to dance with you. Your grandma died, David. Trump just won Florida. <laughs> the worst news, though, came from a middle-aged Russian, Russian nurse. David, ложись на кровать. Держи жопу и раздвигай ягодицы. Which translated is, David, you need to curl up in the fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. <laughs> when I moved to Russia in 2003, I didn't plan on getting penetrated with a rubber hose. I was there to save souls for Jesus. I worked with a Russian Baptist church, pushing an agenda I had inherited from the most anal retentive pastors of my home church. After a year in the town of Saratov, I became disenchanted with the evangelical savior complex. I wondered who I was supposed to save in the first place. What was the point of planting churches in a land that was already Christian? I became a maverick missionary and decided to simply get to know people and appreciate their traditions. I grew close to the Latin American medical students in Saratov. I started hanging around the local Catholic parish and drank beer with the Mexican nuns who worked there. I began to feel at home. Things were looking up. Then I got sick. Beware you who live in the age of coronavirus. Getting sick isn't just a matter of what germs you're exposed to. No, it's about how well protected you are. I had tempted fate for a year in Russia <laughs> with no consequence. I embraced diseased homeless dudes I slept on the ground in the woods. I ate raw fish and eggs. The whole time, my immune system remained robust. The Russian mystery bug waited until my defenses were at their lowest to launch an attack. In April 2004, a year into my stay, I had to leave to renew my visa. The closest and easiest country was Estonia, a former Soviet republic. I spent a week hanging out in the capital city of Tallinn, drinking Pilsner on medieval castle walls, chatting with the locals about the Soviet invasions that they had suffered. Meanwhile, 
the mystery bug sent sleeper agents into my bloodstream. Subversive guerrilla scouts building jungle outposts, waiting for the infrastructure to weaken. And weaken it did. After several days in Estonia, I learned that my visa would take an extra week. I also learned that my bank account was empty. I wouldn't get another deposit until May. I was officially a bum in Estonia. I packed up my backpack and moved out of the cozy youth hostel and into the less cozy public park. Let me tell you, April nights in Estonia get very cold when you spend them outside. I put on all of my socks and all my shirts and I still shivered on the park bench. For nourishment, I gnawed on a salami I had bought when I arrived. When my Russian visa was approved, I used the last of my cash to take the cheapest possible transport back to Saratov. Hard, upright seats on a series of buses and trains that traveled at night across the wilderness. I was so relieved to get back to my apartment where I had a jar of Kopec coins I'd been saving. Pooled together, they equaled a couple bucks, enough to buy a loaf of black bread that would sustain me till the next deposit came in. Sleeping outside, poor nutrition, stress, my defenses were down. That's when the enemy attacked. I went to the Saratov Public Library shortly after returning to give a talk about foreign aggression in Estonia. All the while, the mystery disease rolled into me like a thousand Red Army tanks through the streets of Tallinn. I felt faint when I left the library. I walked home and was drenched in sweat. I called one of the Mexican nuns who worked in the church. No mames, hermana. I don't feel so good. Spiritually? No. Me siento de la chingada, hermana. I feel seriously fucked up, sister. She sent my Colombian friend, Fabiana, to check on me. Fabiana was in her second year of medical school. When she walked into my apartment, her mouth dropped open. Oh, you look like shit, David. Let's call a real doctor. A Russian MD from the public clinic made a house call and took my temperature. It's pretty high, he said in Russian, showing Fabiana the thermometer. But at least he's not at brain damage levels yet. No, pues, I murmured weak, weakly. No, pues, menos mal, cabrón. The doctor looked over his glasses at Fabiana. Is he speaking in tongues? I switched back to Russian. No, doctor, что за диагноз? So, so what's the diagnosis, doc? Uh, not sure yet. What color is your macha? He's asked, using the medical term for feces, macha. Lately, I replied, dark, nearly black. His eyebrows went up. Black? Are you sure? I think I would know, Doc. <laughs> he looked at his thermometer again, and then at my pale face, and then at Fabiana. You might need an hospitalization. I tried to fight it off on my own. I failed. After a week of fever and delirium, my Russian friend Marina came by with a pot of borscht. Oh, you look really bad, David. How bad? Huyova, she said, which literally means as bad as a dick. <laughs> Are you ready to go to the hospital yet? I nodded feebly and mumbled a mixture of languages. I'm ready for it, cabrona. <laughs> Marina called for an ambulance and helped me pack my things. The public hospitals here are pretty bare bones, she warned me. You need to bring all your own supplies, bed sheets, plate, cup, everything. A battered old van showed up with a single wooden bench in the back. I shivered and tried not to fall over on the sharp turns. We parked and Marina half carried me to the intake desk. The nurse looked me up and down severely and handed me a glass jar. I need a sample of your matcha, she said sternly. <laughs> At your service, madame, I said in English. One fecal sample coming right up. She pointed at a door behind me. I walked in and found a dark broom closet, not even a toilet or a roll of toilet paper. <sighs> Talk about bare bones. How am I supposed to squeeze out any matcha in here? So I positioned myself on the cement floor, tripod style, and I held the jar underneath me. Eventually, I had my sample. I wiped with a napkin from my pocket, tossed it on the floor, and walked out holding the jar. The nurse looked up and her face transformed. 
She laughed, really laughed. Big, heaving belly guffaws, very un-Russian nurse-like. <laughs> Finally, she said, with tears streaming down her face, that's not what I wanted from you. And that was when I learned that matcha doesn't actually mean feces. <laughs> I was wrong. Matcha is the Russian word for urine. <laughs> Marina gave me an, a sympathetic look as I held a jar with an entirely unnecessary turd <laughs> sitting in it. I filled out my intake paperwork and I said goodbye to Marina. I put the sheets on my bed, unpacked my things, and lay down to finally get some rest. A nurse walked in to take my temperature. Okay, I said when she left, now I can get some sleep. Ten minutes later, another nurse came in to give me an injection. Okay, now I can get some sleep. A minute later, two more nurses. I looked up. Now what? One of them held a floppy rubber bladder attached to a long tube. Oh, neat, I thought. They brought me a nutritious shake to drink. I smiled and held out my glass for them to serve me. The stone-faced nurse shook her head. Snimaitsustanni. Take off your trousers. I dutifully pulled them down, curious now. Okay, they must be here to wash off my legs with that hose. But where will the runoff water go? And your underwear. I push deeper into denial as I remove my boxers. Okay, they're going to spray down my butthole. <laughs> to clean it. But still, where will the water go? I sat back down on the edge of the bed. The nurse huffed and said the dreaded phrase. Curl up in the fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. I stared incredulous. We need to clean you out, the other nurse said, unceremoniously. Standard procedure. And in they went. <laughs> sad, sad moment. I can't claim to understand for one second... The trauma of someone who experiences sexual violence. I will say this, though. As I felt that cold water enter me, filling my insides with its foreign chill, one thought filled my mind. Nobody should have to bear a pregnancy they didn't ask for. <laughs> the nurse told me to bear my own water pregnancy for five minutes. I waited four and a half. I pooped out the mess and returned to my cot, defeated and utterly empty, and fell into a black and dreamless sleep. The next morning, I realized I was in full quarantine isolation. My only human contacts were the nurses and doctors who came into my room for exams, questions, treatments, pills, injections. They launched a full frontal attack on the mystery disease. Day and night, they injected my ass with the best medicine Russian has to offer. Now, I'm not saying ass colloquially. Everything went into my butt. Suppositories, injections in the butt cheek, several more into enemas. I don't want to make any psychological assumptions about the fathers of Soviet medicine, but they had some major unresolved butt issues. I couldn't complain, though. The medicine was working. I slowly crept back from the brink of death. When I got over the fever and delirium, I realized just how boring an empty hospital room can be. No TV set, no books. One cot, one table, one chair. Food was sparse and bland. Flavorless porridge for breakfast, watery potato soup for lunch and dinner. After four days, I wondered how long I could take it. And then my friends rallied around me. The Mexican nuns went to my apartment to pick up a couple books for my sanity's sake. Dios te bendiga, David. They called out to me from across the hall that separated me from the healthy. I looked out the window in my door and waved back. Mil gracias, hermanas. Son unas chingonas. You sisters are real badasses. <laughs> my Nicaraguan friend, Dorian, put credit on my little Nokia cell phone. I texted Fabiana and sent her my parents' home number. Can you please call my viejos? Tell them my butthole hurts, but I'm alive. <laughs> she texted back. Will do but I'm skipping the butthole part. People brought groceries to break up the monotony of my diet. The Colombians brought tomatoes and cucumbers. The Russian Baptists brought a roasted chicken. When a nurse said that it wasn't allowed, they did the Christian thing and lied about it. They hid it inside a tin under a bed of mashed potatoes. 
I was touched by their effort. I bet they would have brought it inside of their butts if, they, if I had asked them to. Marina continued to check in on me via phone and in person, as did dozens of other friends, Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic Christians, atheists, Jewish folks, Muslim Tartars. I had come to Russia to save souls, and this community of people saved my life. I had come to teach people what to believe, and they taught me that the only thing worth believing in, the deep power of love, real human love, fierce and loyal. They breached the walls of my quarantine for one simple reason, I was a person in need. In doing so, they breached our self-imposed human quarantines of language, creed, and politics, and came together, working as one body. And that's what saved me. In the end, it's the only hope of saving any of us. Some people discover this transformative love at a time of personal tragedy, a natural disaster or a death in the family. Me, I discovered this love in my time of enemas, and it's still up inside of me to this day. <laughs>